So, on leaving the park, we crossed from the bumpy Samburu sand trails to the glossy straight tarmac road. The road was quiet, with more people walking along it than driving. We drove through the nearest town, Isiolo, and beyond, out into the bush again. Chris knew where we were heading, and Heather and I knew we had to go, even though we didn't want to. It was somehow important to witness it. The thorny bushes took on a more sinister appearance as we crashed through, looking for a carcass. There were no vultures to guide us, but we didn't really need to look. It was the smell and the sound that knocked me off my feet. The corpse was buzzing with flies and hazy with a rotting stench. I gagged several times and tried to swallow, burning the back of my throat with acid and disgust. What was lying on the ground wasn't an elephant anymore. It was a gray faceless mass squirming with maggots. It didn't seem as though it could have been an elephant a week ago, although that's what Chris estimated. He took samples to identify the elephant because a lot of the features, trunk, tusks, eyes, were gone, hacked away. We might need tissue and blood to identify this elephant by its DNA. It was an adult female, Chris told us, but it didn't look that way. It looked like a melted candle of an elephant. The ear slumped and there was an open wound where the face should have been. The feet had been removed and one lay forlornly a couple of meters away, those beautiful elephant toes disconnected. I was too weak for this. My stomach certainly was, and I felt the vomit rise again, this time from really deep. The image of it steeped in bile came into my head and I imagined heaving black blood like the clotted patches on the elephant remain. On the elephant remains. I stepped back for some cleaner air and clearer thoughts. But it only got worse. Chris pointed out the hyena tracks and even a dead hyena that had probably been killed in the scramble for access to the elephant. This was a crucible of death, but instead of being vivid, it felt dull. The color was drained out. Everything was drained. I swallowed my vomit again and the death stench wrapped around me. Within months of this, seeing this fetid corpse, there would be many more terrible reminders of the importance of family to elephants. Orphaned elephants with no older females left behind, and in other cases, the team would find the body of a baby elephant by its mother. While the first elephant corpse I ever saw was garishly gruesome, these calves could be heartbreakingly intact and peaceful. A swollen infant that could, no, that could merely be sleeping if it weren't too stiff, too still, too close to the buzzing flies re reproducing in the remains of its mother. The bond between mother and baby was simply too strong, so the calf had stayed close and, and died there. Another victim, less bloody, even more tragic. I don't remember the drive back to our camp, but I knew something had shifted. We were all feeling some kind of loss. Mine was of innocence. <laughs> Drama scene. Um, but now I'm gonna read hopefully a happier one. <laughs> and we're shifting to Thailand now where U is filming the elephants. I hope everyone can see them. I traveled to Northern Thailand in the wet season of 2011. I felt as though I had barely stepped out of the car when my skin exploded with mosquito bites, but I didn't care. I was meeting Josh Plotnik. Josh was researching elephant cognition here. He was a New Yorker and spoke as though he was impatient, as though he didn't have time to beat around the bush and as though he was gonna change the world. He laughed at me a lot when I ordered hot black tea instead of iced coffee. I'd read his work and expected a kind of professorial type, but I got a friend, a confident, an innovator. What surprised me was that back then he was willing to listen to me at all. I remember walking around the village with him close to his study site. It looked out onto the Mekong River, which at this point was wide and open like the best horizons. We could see Myanmar and Laos on the other side. I followed Josh along the pavement, weaving between the dogs and the plastic, plastic stools outside of the restaurants, adverts for boat tours and, the motor, and parked motor scooters. Josh would greet people in Thai, know where, what the best food was to order, and would balance delicately on a little plastic stool to eat it. It was the same stool I tripped over minutes before. I told him about my vision, that elephant life history had evolved in parallel to that of humans. But it, it was incredible that we humans had so much in common with the elephants in spite of that distant relatedness. The long life, the offspring dependence, the learning in a long childhood phase, the high investment in calves or kids. And we didn't share it because of a recent common ancestor. It was deeper than that. 
It was a shared strategy, a shared approach to a certain kind of life, and a rare one. He grinned at me. He'd been on a similar track, but as a psychologist. He was thinking of the convergence in terms of cognition and behavior. From two disciplines, we'd come to a similar conclusion. Potentially, elephants make strategies like humans do, and it's interesting for precisely because they're genetically distant from us. And we'd found each other out there on the banks of the Mekong. As well as Josh, I met the humble, and you will know him, and self-effacing John Roberts, who directed the elephant camp and the associated charity at the time, and now works on conservation projects across the world. John, John's Englishness was a contrast to Josh's New York attitude, but John wasn't bumbling. He was sharp, even though he wouldn't admit to it, and he was very kind and understanding of researchers. He knew the best local beers. He'd listened patient to, patiently to me talk about weighing elephants, balancing the pros and cons of different life history strategies, and he'd look at all the plots I made. Saddle shapes, color grades, and error bars. This was kind of data in the visual realm, the human and tangible type kind, and it was my favorite, but not necessarily everyone wants to be bombarded with it. John took it all in. Josh and John took the time to listen to me before I had lots of letters after my name and before I published any empirical work to back it up. They also expanded my vision and they introduced me to some extraordinary elephants. One was Pepsi. When I first saw Pepsi, he was a young male on the cusp of adolescence. He was about 11 years old. He was already taller than my head at his shoulder. He was playful and very closely bonded to his Mahout and the Mahout's family. He used to wrap his trunk around his Mahout's daughter and lift her up, making her squeal with laughter. He was also very good at picking up the discarded flip-flops of tourists, passing them gently to his Mahout's. I have a photo of him and me from that time. I'm grinning and throwing a peace sign, and there's a blast of wet season green foliage behind us. I'm resting my hand on top of Pepsi's head, feeling his fine spiky hairs. They're the texture of two fresh bristles, but black and densely distributed. He has his trunk curled up in the air, his two tusks already prominently jutting out, his eye reflecting in the light of the camera. We're standing in a grassy area, slightly claggy with mud at that time of year. This is where Josh did his experiments. Okay, I'm going to, I think, stop there so that we have 15 minutes for Q&A. <laughs> but um, I think the way that we're going to deal with this, because everyone's muted for security reasons, fun, um, but what you need to do is you can type questions into the chat area <laughs> you can type questions into the chat area or you can raise your hand and we, me or one of the other admins can unmute you while you ask a question. If anyone has questions, I know I actually now know most of the people on this call. We probably lost some people. John, John's suggesting that I just read more. It's like bedtime stories here. Okay, I'll read another section. Okay, so this is the first time that I hung out with elephants at all. This is in Kenya. I was staying in a tent underneath a corrugated iron roof to protect me from the vervet monkey excrement dropping from the tree when I woke in the morning. I had an orange plastic bucket to wash in, which a small antelope with a spring in its step, known as a clip springer, had also taken to using as a fresh water supply. I would go to the water pump every morning and fill up a transparent bottle. I would leave this in the center of camp, exposed to the sun, in order to warm the water for my afternoon bucket shower. I became used to the long drop, even thankful for the breeze it created and making sure I put a rope across the entrance so that people knew I was in there. I played checkers using the tops from beer bottles. The gold Tusker brand ones got me thinking of the symbolic power elephants have over us. As well as the curious clip springer, I met some of the other animals that frequented the camp. A pair of hornbills, still striking in their senescence with white and black feathers and curved orangey yellow beaks, a band of mongooses hunting by the breakfast table. 
The troop of baboons I'd first met on the bridge appeared calmer as they traversed the slope next to our breakfast table undisturbed. There was a group of rock hyraxes, fluffy mammals that looked a bit like oversized guinea pigs, but, there are, but are actually some of the closest living relatives of elephants. They slept a lot and sometimes took a break from basking in the sun to investigate the bags of flour in the food store. But however charming these characters were, I hadn't yet seen an elephant. After all, that's why I'd come all the way to Kenya. The following morning at breakfast, I got much more than chai, toast, and honey, my first wild elephant sighting. To this day, I can't imagine a better gateway to watching elephants. And I can't begin to explain how lucky I was that it happened when I was on foot and in the camp. The former because it allowed me to sense the scale of the elephant in front of me and my own fragility, which is just not possible in a vehicle. And the latter because I was familiar enough with the camp not to let the experience terrify and overwhelm me. An old male elephant, Jaeger, had come to investigate the collars that had been worn by elephants to mount their tracking devices. The delicacy with which he handled these bulky and decaying pieces of abandoned equipment touched me. He explored them with the tip of his trunk and turned them gently detecting the scent from their former wearers faded over time. I remember his face so clearly. It was wide above the trunk, as happens to males with age, with deep horizontal wrinkles traversing the front of his face. Either side, his eyes were looking downwards, the direction of his gaze emphasized by the dr dramatically long and spindly eyelashes shading them. His tusks were thick at the base, another sign of his age, his right tusk splayed out to the side and formed a stubby but impressive point, while the left one had a messy jagged break about five centimeters down from his lip line, exposing layers of hard tissue and giving him a rakish, rugged appearance. Jaeger moved slowly, but with so much power and intention. I watched him pull up grass with the tip of his trunk, flick the trunk back and forth to remove the dust from the roots and place the grass in his mouth, chewing methodically and rhythmically. I don't know how long I watched him for. It could have been minutes or hours, but it didn't matter because it was on his time. The pace of my perception slowed to match his, and with it, some of the urgency of this world diminished. The irresistible urge to push forward, even when I didn't know why I was doing it. As he eventually eased his way out of the camp, he paused to defecate, dropping five balls of caramel colored dung. When he was safely out of the way, I walked over to where he'd been, taking time to look at his footprints in the sand with their crisscrossing cracks like trails on a map. From the flat area at the back of his foot, I could work out the direction in which he'd been walking. I could see that he'd rested his trunk on the ground, leaving a valley of ripples. I smelled his dung, grassy, warm, not the slightest bit repulsive. I squeezed it between my fingers, letting the yellow green water run down my arm. There was life in that dung. I felt the barely digested plant material gathered from kilometers away and deposited here, the potential for dung beetles to roll it away or a frog to take up residence there or the seeds in it to germinate. I thought of the worm eggs I'd only later see under the microscope and smaller still, his DNA, the bacteria from his gut, the metabolized fragments of all of his hormones. I saw him at once as more than the sum of his parts, part of a vital system that was both much bigger and much smaller than him. That's another section. <laughs> so I hope that that was kind of enjoyable. Um, I know that we still, yeah, <laughs> we still have a few people online um, and some questions. So I think that we have five or 10 minutes that we can do questions. Um, can you tell us which questions which research questions you're looking at at the moment and a bit more about the Nepal project. So we've been working in Nepal now for just over a year. The questions that we're looking at there are slightly different from the stuff that I was able to do at the different locations. Um, so there we're looking at human elephant interactions, a bit on food choices and a bit on how with Josh, how elephants use their senses when different senses when they're making choices. So that's another cool thing for us to be collaborating on and really interesting to be working with captive elephants again and 
it's a whole different range of opportunities. Like it's captive elephants are great for kind of experiments, control things. Obviously what you're going to observe isn't natural behavior. Um, it's captive elephant behavior, but that in itself is interesting. Uh, do I know the elephant behind me? The elephant behind me, I took this photograph from a hide in South Africa. And we were, I was just helping out on a really fun experiment um, using, basically, we know that elephants are afraid of bees, but not everyone can keep bees. It's really expensive. In an arid area, you need to keep like supplying bees with sugar water and things like that. So a team at the University of Hawaii has isolated bee attack pheromone, and they've turned it into this like goo and you can smear it everywhere as an elephant deterrent. Um, and I don't, if there's anyone else here who's British, it smells like pear drops. It smells like pear drops, it's bizarre. And I told everyone it smelled like pear drops. No one knew what I meant because there weren't any other British people there, but like old fashioned British sweets, it smells just like them. Um, so yeah, we were doing that experiment there and we basically smeared um, plants in one area <laughs> yeah, with this pear drop um, be attacked pheromone scent and this elephant came along from the other side so avoiding the area with the be attacked pheromone scent to go to the waterhole. Um, it's not elephant specific though, all the animals avoided it, like the only ones that didn't avoid it were the warthogs. I don't know if they're just more bold or they've got thick skin. Hasn't been tried in Asia, this, this was in southern Africa. So that was, that was an interesting thing to participate in. Did I always know that I wanted to work on elephants? No. <laughs> I didn't know very much about elephants at all. And I thought kind of the thing that I alluded to in the section with me and Josh, um, like I wanted to understand being human and it seemed to me like the logical way to do that is you study primates, right? You study chimpanzees, you study bonobos or gorillas because those are our closest living relatives. And this idea of convergence or actually the utility of studying a wider range of animals, it didn't dawn on me until much later. I was late to that party. So I, I was probably in my mid twenties before I was like, oh, this is so cool especially because I don't know how Josh feels about this and other people who do research on elephants is like, we've still got a way to go in comparison to the primate people. Like in terms of what we know, you know, there's still a lot of opportunities there. Um, so yeah, I started out working on primates and, and humans. I mean, humans are a primate. I don't like this human, non-human primate distinction. <laughs> Oh yeah, you know, it's like, and Franz de Waal, who was actually Josh's PhD supervisor, writes about this so much better than I do, but I mention him in the book. This idea that anthropomorphizing is a kind of cardinal sin of doing research on animals. It's very pervasive, right? It, it's something that a lot of us take on. Um, but actually, we study humans in such a different way to the way that we study animals because we create this hard line. Actually, we might be doing some injustices to them, right? Because we're not giving them the opportunity to show some of the things that we allow humans to. At the same time, they do plenty of stuff that we don't do that is fascinating and interesting and not less valuable just because it's not something that humans do, right? So for example, we really love language because we use it a lot, like spoken language, the way that I'm speaking to you now, you know, we use that a lot as humans, but maybe we don't give other kinds of communication, like say chemical communication, Kaya who's here studies that. Like um, we might not give that as much credit because maybe humans don't focus on it as much. Having said all of that, so with the similarities and the differences, I think that if you've ever seen the way that an elephant behaves around the remains of an elephant, we don't know exactly what is going on there. Um, but it, there's a lot of behavior directed at those remains. There's a lot of attention. 
given to them like potentially like if it's a recent recently de deceased elephant then a lot of elephants will go to it family members and also others um but even the bones of an elephant that might have been dead for for months even years they hold a lot of attraction there's a lot of behavior associated with them and i wouldn't necessarily say that it's the most human but it's definitely something that you know it strikes you as a person looking at that because we know you know our experiences with losing other humans and how we feel about that so there's, there's definitely something there but there's a limit to how much we actually know about it so far do we have any other questions then maybe i mean it's 10 45 which is when we said that we would finish oh josh has got his hands up uh john's got his hand up sorry I can unmute john i've unmuted john hi hannah i was just going to say yes um if if that's all and there are no more questions then uh let's maybe maybe wrap up um Last chance for questions, ladies, the last chance you get to hear and see Hannah. Um, again, apologies to everybody for the, uh, for the lack of security and the, the pitch invasion we had earlier, earlier today. Um, we will try, I think, and reschedule this so that we, can, people, we get a chance to talk to people that we don't know. But um, for those of you who rejoined, um, thank you very, very much for joining. Um, and uh, we, will, we, will do, we will do more. Um, we will have better security for Dr. Josh's talk, which is next week at the slightly earlier on... Tuesday next week at the slightly earlier time of 6.30. Um, and we will talk to Hannah and see if we can do this again with, um, with better security. This was, our, this was our first attempt at it. And thank you for everyone for joining and sticking with us. We now know that there are people out there who, for reasons best known to themselves, don't feel like, or not only don't feel like hearing about lovely words about elephants, they, they decide to stop other people. But we now know they exist and we will guard against them in the future. Um, and so, yes, thank you very much for, uh, thank you very much for joining. Um, a little bit, I've, ah, we have a last question. Where can we get the book and get it signed? Uh, so it's available in all good bookshops and you can also buy it online. Um, I have several copies in Hong Kong, if someone wants to buy one of those. And if you're in Hong Kong, then I know that Carolus is a student here. I can sign it for you. <laughs> <laughs> If not, you have to track Hannah down. <laughs> and she travels all over the world when it opens up as well. So yeah. will, you will find her somewhere. Okay. And so, yeah, a, a little bit note about our foundation for those. I think everybody does know us, but a little bit of a note. We're here in the Golden Triangle. This is the first of our lecture series that we will be doing with elephant professionals. Um, we do live stream elephants in the way that Kun uh, U has been doing all the way through this talk twice a day. So please do feel free to join us for this. And um, if you do feel you'd like to help us, we are a Thai registered foundation. So you can, you, a don any donations to help us look after the elephants we have on site and the 3000 elephants potentially out of work for uh, in Thailand, uh, their donations are very much appreciated and um, will be well spent for a Thai registered foundation. I will put the links on the chat um, but it's not about us, it's about Hannah. So I will turn you back to Hannah, I think, for a final goodbye. Thank you, John. Well, thank you everyone for coming and yeah, <laughs> and putting up with the issues, but it was really lovely to read some of this out loud and maybe we'll get the chance to do it again. So thank you so much. And thank you, John, for co-hosting and bringing the elephants on. And yeah, it was an experience for sure. <laughs> And everybody buy the book. It's a great book. As I say, I'm three quarters of the way through it already. It is a fantastic book. Um, and it is available on Kindle for those of you who can't get hard copies. And my, my Kindle edition is lovely too. Um, and you will see, I will continue to post quotes and everything else as time goes on. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody.